hopes for a little bit of hope oh come oh come Emmanuel a child prays for peace on earth and she's calling out from her sea of heard oh come oh come Emmanuel With the tears of a mother A baby's cry is the sound of love Come down, come down, Emmanuel Oh, here's the song for the suffering Here's Messiah, the Prince of Church. Oh come, oh come, Emmanuel. We're going to uh, open up our congregational singing with a medley of two songs, God Rest You Merry Gentlemen and We Three Kings. I hope you can keep up or catch up. Uh, as you get ready to sing, why don't you stand? Make sure you know the name of the person beside you. Say hello. Uh, give them a greeting. And uh, let's get ready to sing. God rest you merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay, remember Christ. 
Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. From God our Heavenly Father a blessed angel came And unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same How that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy Oh, tidings of comfort and joy Star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. you had fun with that one as much as we do. You may be seated. What did you, what did you tell me earlier, Jesse? Bring the energy. A little bit of energy, Ross. A little bit of energy. <laughs> now I'm all worn out, right, from that, those songs. So, Thank you, worship team, for your choice of songs there. Uh, I think the first thing we're going to have, right, Jesse, is the Advent wreath with the Devin Stoltzfus family. And, and Lisa, too, but maybe Lisa's not here, so. I'm sad. I've lost people that I love. The news is full of destruction and disease and death. Where is Jesus? There's a storm crashing around me. I hear noise and thunder, but I don't hear Jesus. What does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? The prophet Isaiah says, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself, is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Another prophet says, The Lord your God is with you the mighty warrior who saves. 
he will take great and delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. God says, I will deal with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. The Apostle Paul says, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Today we light the third Advent candle. Uh, um, when you see this candle, tell God what you need. Listen for Jesus. God is with us. Thank you, Stoltzfuses. So uh, we will follow that up with the devotions and the scripture coming from the book of Isaiah, which is going to be a very familiar passage to, I would say, perhaps anyone, but particularly those that uh, have grown up in the church and been through the Advent season in church for many, many years. Um, it is Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. So only two verses today. Only two verses. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So we've been in Revelation. Jesse's going to continue in Revelation. Um, I ran across this this morning. Just a little blurb I want to share with you. Um, and the title of it was, Did Jesus Exist Before Christmas? And so this is a, apparently LifeWay Research did a study, and it says less than half of Americans, including just 63% of church-going Christians, so half of all Americans, but 63 of church-going Christians, believe Jesus existed before his virgin birth in Bethlehem. Lifeway's Scott McConnell explains that while biblical prophecies such as Isaiah 9, quote, reflect that the Messiah would be the wonderful counselor, mighty God, some Americans, and I, I guess I'll add this, and apparently, uh, whatever the math is, 37% of Christians um, do not connect the Jesus born in Bethlehem with the Messiah who already existed as God now coming in the flesh. Uh, so again, we've been in Revelation, and when I read this verse, I see wonderful counselor, um, everlasting father, government upon his shoulders stick out to me. Government upon his shoulders, uh, and then in verse 7 it says that that governing is going to be without end. And I thought about the governing, and I thought about the old saying that power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely, which is a true statement relative to us, humans, but a false statement as it relates to Jesus Christ. So in 19, in Revelation 19, we're going to see Jesus coming back 
with absolute power um, and that does not corrupt him like it would us. Uh, God places a restraint on the amount of power that any person, any human can achieve, but Jesus' power will be increasing and will never end. So a wonderful counselor is another thing that jumps out. And the word wonderful here literally means incomprehensible. And uh, I thought about how that word we use, well, that was a wonderful meal. That was a wonderful song. That was a wonderful... Don't, don't use that same word. Don't, don't use that same meaning with the wonderful counselor. The Messiah will cause us to be full of wonder. The word is much weightier here than the way we commonly use it. I would say Jesus is wonderful in a way that will boggle our minds. Again, look at the description in chapter 19 of Revelation. It's, uh, it's different. Everlasting Father. So that, that leads you Father forever in perpetuity, without end. Uh, I read that Everlasting Father could also be translated as Father of Eternity, the creator of all things, Father of time and eternity, the architect of the ages. So think about the beginning of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That should uh, hopefully fall us... Uh, cause us to fall into that category of the 63% that realize, yes, Jesus was from the beginning. He didn't just come onto the scene at Christmas time. And what's interesting about Isaiah and all this, you know, we're still looking forward just as the people in Isaiah, at the time of Isaiah and Isaiah himself, just as we're still looking forward as they were, we do have more information we do have the Holy Spirit now present in our lives. We have the testimony of the life of Christ. We have the full body of Scripture. So we should be aware of this. We should take comfort in that. We're still looking forward, but it should be an even stronger faith and even stronger conviction than what people at that time had. So in Revelation 19, 6 to 7, this is what's written. Hallelujah. And I think, Jesse, you ended with this last week which was really powerful. Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. And hopefully that is what we are here this morning to do. Amen. Announcements. Uh, to ask you again, check the round table in the middle of the lobby for the devotional readings for Christmas. Take whatever resources you find there. Sign up for one of these poinsettias um, if you'd like that at your house for Christmas. There are seven tags left on the Christmas tree in the back for the lighthouse. Um, those tags will be coming off, Phil. Did you say next week those tags will be coming off? You have until next Sunday to take a tag? No. Next Sunday the gifts have to be returned. So get a tag today, bring your gifts back next Sunday. There's nomination uh, sheets that were out for nominating um, officers of the church. Uh, you should have one of those in your physical mailbox. Uh, those can be put in the offering box in the back. So there is an offering box in the back. If you feel led to put an offering in there, that's where you would do that. The prayer box is outside. To your right as you exit, if you have prayer concerns, uh, those of you visiting, uh, should have said this at the beginning, welcome. Welcome to Waterway Church. Thank you for being here. We're glad that you're here. Uh, if you would feel led to filling out a connection card so that we know who you are and we can connect with you. So next Sunday, during the Sunday school hour, um, after, after uh, Christopher Smoker gets done teaching a, a really great adult Sunday school um, that's kind of a joke. We're not having adult Sunday school. I signed him up to teach and then realized we're not having it. So excellent job, Christopher. Um, we're going to have a children's Christmas play here at 930. So I'd really encourage everyone to be here. Uh, it'll, it'll be here. Uh, there will be no Sunday school, just nursery for those that need it. I think that is all I have for announcements. If we could move on to a time of prayer requests and concerns. Uh, 
and there are prayer requests or prayer notices in the bulletin, uh, which should be out in the lobby. Uh, we are going to celebrate this morning that John Coverly is doing better following our prayers. The psoriasis is uh, doing better, but we're going to continue to pray for full healing of that in John. There are a lot of families in our body here that are dealing with COVID in one way or the other. We're going to pray for healing, patience, and uh, wise decisions in how to handle all this going through it. And with that in mind, we want to pray specifically for Wilmer and Arlene Kreider. They asked for our prayers. They are struggling right now with COVID. They are at home. So please lift them up and continue with the Gowdy family, particularly Greg, as he works towards uh, getting off of oxygen. So uh, I would ask that we continue to lift up the Cunningham family, their recent loss, uh, Debbie Hale with... Um, her father nearing the end of his life here on earth. And uh, probably on a lot of people's minds right now, I would guess would be the tornado victims uh, in the Midwest, particularly in Kentucky. All of that pretty uh, devastating. Um, would you join with me now in a time of prayer, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come here this morning just thankful for the opportunity you give us to gather as the body of Christ. We thank you for this time of year where there is so much joy and energy and just thankfulness and um, just wonder and amazement at how your whole being and power and strength and energy and just who you are, Father God, all came down into that little tiny package, that little tiny body, that being uh, of Jesus Christ incarnate on this earth. That is an incredible thing that I don't know if we can ever fully wrap our minds around. Um, we're thankful for that. Let us just continue to study that, think on that, and pray about that, and give you glory for that, Father that you chose to send him to this earth with all of its issues, all of its problems, and most of all with us, with humans, uh, full of injustice and wrongs and sins that you chose to send your son, Jesus Christ, to save us from them. We're thankful for that. Thank you, Father. Lord, we pray specifically for the Criders. We pray for the Hale family. We pray for the Cunninghams. We pray for the Fosters. We pray for all of those dealing with COVID and other illnesses. We pray for those that just have a grieving hearts this time of year, that this time of year uh, triggers feelings and emotions that are just hard to deal with, uh, bring back memories that are painful. Uh, Holy Spirit, we ask you to be present in those believers' lives to comfort them. Um, we pray that we can take comfort in the fact of knowing that we will see our loved ones again that believed in your son, Jesus Christ, and accepted his work on the cross, that we will see them again, that this is a temporary thing. Um, so just let those people take comfort in knowing that. Those that are dealing with health struggles again, Father, we ask that you be with them, heal them somehow, some way, either here or in the future in heaven. So, Father, we just lift up the rest of our service. We pray a blessing on Jesse as he brings the message from your holy word. Let it be exactly what you would have him to give to us today. Uh, transmit your word through him faithfully, honestly, truthfully, and with passion and excitement because it is exciting to read your word and learn more about you and draw closer to you as a body of Christ. Again, we thank you for this opportunity. We ask a blessing on the rest of our service, and we ask this in the holy, precious name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. I invite you to stand with us once again in our time of music and song and worship this morning. How great our joy. by the
the sheep we watched at night. Glad tidings brought, an angel bright. How great our joy, great our joy. Joy, 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 joy. Praise we the Lord in heaven on high. Praise we the Lord in heaven on high. There shall be born, so he did say, in Bethlehem a child today. How great our joy.
law is love and his gospel is peace chain shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we let all within us praise his holy name Christ is the Lord oh praise his name I'd like to invite the kids forward, those who are going to be going to Waterway 25 today. Uh, that is, no, no, Steve, oh, Children's Church? Man, I just can't, I ought to know. I look in the back, I see Squeaky in Steve's arms. I should know it's a Children's Church. So a Children's Church Sunday, that means kids who are between four years old and first grade. You guys are, are able to go to Children's Church if you'd like to and if your parents think that that's cool. All right, so come on down. All right, a couple more. There we go. Hey, Emma. How's it going, guys? Good to see you today. Are you excited to be here? Yeah. All right. Come on, a little better. Are you excited to be here? Yeah. One more time. Are you excited to be here? Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, I'm excited that you're here, too. I want to tell you about two things, two things that are coming up. All right. First of all, in it's not even two weeks away on a Thursday night, two days before Christmas, okay, not Christmas Eve, but Christmas Eve Eve, we're going to be having a service here where we're going to sing all kinds of Christmas songs, and some of the kids are going to read some Christmas, Christmas uh, passages. You're going, to be, you're going to be coming too? All right, Caden, I'm excited. Well, and, and so, so on Christmas Eve Eve, you need to make sure that your parents bring you to the Christmas Eve Eve service. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to sing a lot of songs and, and read a lot of scripture, and then... Here's what I'm trying to encourage people to do. Maybe your moms and dads will do this. I'm encouraging people to have little Christmas parties at their house after the Christmas Eve Eve service. That way, you can invite all your friends who don't normally come to church, invite them to come to the Christmas Eve Eve service, and then come to your house for like Christmas cookies and candy and hot chocolate. Would that sound like it'd be fun? Yes. Yes, it does, Audrey. You ought to talk to your parents about that. And so I'm encouraging you guys have parties at your house after the Christmas Eve Eve service. A great way to invite people to church. All right? Now, here's the other thing that I'm excited about. You have children's church today. Are you ready? Do you see who's, do you see who's helping Pastor Steve to lead today? Now, now, let's take a vote. How many, of you, how many of you like Squeaky a lot? How many of you like Pastor Steve a lot? 
Well, you get to listen to both of them. Before you go, before you, what do we always do before Children's Church? Do we pray? Remember how we always pray, right? So let's pray. I'm going to put my hands together and bow my head and close my eyes. You can do that too, Drew. That's, I'm going to do this today, but if you'd like to do that and kind of just be talking to God, you can do that too. So whichever way you like, okay? Either hands up or hands together. I'm going to do it this way today. God, I'm thankful. Oh, Lord, I'm thankful for these boys and girls. I thank you that they're praying to you, coming to you, lifting their hands to you, bowing their heads before you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you help us as a church, as their families, help us to do a great job raising them to love you. And Lord, I pray for Steve and Squeaky today as they teach a lesson and show these guys more of who Jesus is. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. You can go find Pastor Steve and, and Squeaky. Sometimes I'd like to have one of those... Uh, like one of those decibel meters, like the applause meters like, who loves Steve more than Squeaky? But then he's going to turn it around on me one day. Who loves Steve more than Jesse? And he's going to win, and it's going to be big trouble. Um, hey, before we get started up today, uh, I, do want to make, uh, I do want to make two quick announcements uh, for you guys. Number one is uh, grown-up grown up guys. You'd be called men, right? Um, there is a, uh, there's a men's retreat happening the last weekend in January. It's not just for our church. There are some other churches that, that pitch in. Uh, it's not quite a church retreat, but it is a Christian retreat. It's the last weekend in January. I'm going to be helping to lead it. It's going to be up in the mountains of Pennsylvania. Um, check out wildgooseevents.org if you'd like to know more about this Thursday night till Sunday afternoon retreat last week in January. You'll see more about that in, in your newsletters this week. But then also, had a very important awareness. Uh, last week was Drew Bender's birthday. and He's the one down here in the front today. He said, can we pray this way? And I forgot to sing to him. Um, so I hope you'll wish him happy birthday on the way out. But today, right now, it is, right now it's Sierra's birthday. And so we're going to sing happy birthday to Sierra. I think she may have actually had to step out of the lobby for a moment. Oh, there's Sierra. Hey, Sierra. How old are you today? 27. All right. Well, and, and there may be others of you, but I'm just not aware of it because you didn't tell me. But Sierra told me, so we're going to sing to her. Can we sing to Sierra? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sierra. Happy birthday to you. All right. So happy birthday. Happy birthday. It is amazing how dates get stuck in some of our heads. Now, some of you have no concept of this at all. Some of you don't have a calendar. You don't have a schedule. You don't know what the date is today. You don't care what the date is tomorrow. You're just going to wake up and do what you have to do or do what you're told to do. Some of you in this room have no concept of time. But how many of you in this room have a very strong concept of time? You know exactly what the day is today, maybe because it's your birthday. How many of you know exactly how many days it is until Christmas Eve Eve and until Christmas, until the first of the year, until this is due on the 5th, and then this is going to be due on the 17th? How many of you are that way? You've got your calendar all filled out, but it's not just on your calendar, it's in your head. Many of us, many of us, because of the way that we do our jobs, because of the way that schools tend to run, because of some of the seasons of things that happen at church, many of us have these dates in our minds, and so we become conditioned to being time and deadline oriented people. This messes us up sometimes when we read the book of Revelation because we start to say, when? Lord, when? We're not the only ones. In Revelation chapter 6, we read this about two and a half months ago, there were these martyrs. As God is starting to, to move in the end times, there was this account in Revelation 6, the martyrs, that is those who were killed for their faith in Jesus Christ, they cried out, how long, Lord, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Do you remember that? We talked about these saints, these who were killed for their faith, crying out to God as things are starting to spool up. They say, how long, Lord, until you make everything right? And what did God say to them? He told them to wait a little longer. How much longer? Well, this is all they were given. God didn't give a date. He's never given any of us a date for when Jesus is going to return again. But here in Revelation 6 is what these martyrs were told, these ones who are crying out simply for God's justice. 
God spoke to them and said, you're going to have to wait a little longer until the number of your fellow servants and brothers who are to be killed as you have been killed is completed. Revelation 6, the answer is given. This stuff is going to go on until all of the martyrs are killed. That's a fun deadline, isn't it? I mean, you could, you could justifiably ask the question, how many people have to die before God comes back, Jesus comes back, and wipes out all evil and sets things up for good? You and I who are date-oriented people, how many of you have ever had to wait for a death? Either a death that you were hoping for or a death that you were dreading. That's quite a spot, isn't it? And so remember, you people who are oriented very strongly around time, there are some interesting things happening here in Revelation, and we need to keep in mind the time with God is a little bit different than some of the times that we might like to think about on our own. And then just one more piece of kind of warm-up reminder introduction before we get into Revelation 19. Here in Revelation 19, we're seeing things turn. We're seeing God finally acting in such a way that, that evil is being kind of taken care of. It, it's not just judgment upon evil, but it's kind of a final setting evil aside sort of a thing. There's a lot of hallelujahs and praise gods and all that in Revelation 19. But before we get there, I want to remind you of something we've been talking about a lot, but I don't think we can talk about too much. Four passages in Revelation that, that lead up to this that have to be remembered. The first is Revelation 9, verse 20, and you'll see that these are all very similar. In Revelation 9, 20, judgment is happening on the earth. It's one of God's, uh, it's one of God's judgment to, to try to get people's attention. Some plagues have been delivered, and it says in Revelation 9, verse 20, that the rest of mankind who were not killed by the plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. So there is a judgment that comes from God. There are plagues on the earth, and people don't turn back to God. They keep doing what they were doing. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, John says he sees an angel flying in the air, and this angel had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who lived on the earth. And remember, this is in the midst of God's terrible plagues and things that are happening and all these judgments being poured out. An angel flying in midair has the gospel to proclaim to every nation, tribe, language, and people. It says in Revelation 14, 7, that this angel said in a loud voice to all the nations of the earth, fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Even in the midst of these plagues, remember, there is an opportunity to turn to God. There are people who don't turn away from God. We're told about saints who endure so much of this. But there is this call, even in the midst of judgment, turn to God, fear God, give him glory. There are a lot of chances for people to get right with God. Revelation 16, verses 8 and 9, talks about this. There are these bold judgments, terrible things happening on the earth. It says the fourth angel, verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. The sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. We don't know exactly what this looks like, but basically there are lots of people feeling a lot of pain, and it's coming out of the sky. It says these people, verse 9, were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. Do you see how people have choices? And then in Revelation 16, just a few verses later, that was the fourth angel where judgments came from the sun. Here the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. Its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. But, it says in Revelation 16, 11, they refused to repent of what they had done. Why do I make sure that we remember those four sections of verses as we lead into Revelation 19 today? It is to remind all of us that until it's all over, it ain't over. Until God brings his judgment, God continues to call through the angels, through judgments, through situations, through circumstances, through people. God continues to call out to all the world saying, come to me. Repent. Leave your sin behind. Leave your old life behind. 
God says, you can choose to turn to me. Do it. And at least four times here in Revelation, we see that God keeps giving out this call and people keep saying, no. Sometimes you get the impression it's almost a no thanks. Other times it's a no, go away. We want to do what we want to do. Justice will be served. Don't fall into the trap that some people would like you to fall into. That God is just some mean God waiting to smite people because he likes to smite people. No, no, no. God is waiting to judge the earth, but not because he enjoys it. Not because he wants to see people die. God is waiting because he wants to see everyone who's going to come to him. But there comes a time when that number is complete. And there comes a time when all the people who are going to be killed for God are going to be dead. And at that point, God's going to say, okay, the only ones of you left on the earth are all of you who have over and over and over rejected me. And at that point, what does a righteous God do? At that point, a righteous God says, you rejected me? Okay, I reject you. And so these judgments happen. We studied last week a little bit quickly about these characters. There's a beast. There's an antichrist. There, these, are, these are working with the power of Satan. They are evil, and they are encouraging people to worship Satan. It says in Revelation, uh, the end of Revelation 18, that, that God brings his judgments and his justice. And in Revelation 19, as Ross began to read today, starting in verse 1, John says, remember, John is seeing all this. It's a vision that's given to John from the Lord through an angel. John is seeing all this, and he says, after all these things in Revelation 18, after that happened, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And then in Revelation 19, verse 3, it says that again, the people shouted, everybody together, hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. People are watching the systems of the world personified here in Revelation 18 as this, as this great prostitute, this Babylon. They're watching the systems of the world burn, and they shout, hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. It is this picture that all of the stuff that humanity has created that is not of God, that is opposed to God, that has not repented and turned to God, it's all burning. John says, there's a great multitude in heaven shouting, hallelujah. The word's not there, but you could almost insert the word, finally. Verse Four, the 24 elders. We read about these in the very beginning of Revelation. These are, these are around the throne of the Lord, praising God. And there's four living creatures. They all fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne. And they cried, amen, church, hallelujah. And then a voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. And then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. And so here's this picture of the wedding supper of the Lamb. Jesus Christ and all of humanity being wed together, making commitments together. I will be yours, you will be mine. In an unbreakable bond, there will be no more adultery and no more turning away. This marriage will be perfect. And then the angel, verse 9, said to me, remember, this is still an angel kind of accompanying John through this tour, this vision of what would be the angel said to John, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. 
John sees this powerful vision, and we've been studying it now for three months. John sees this vision about what God is planning, about what is going to be, and he hears things, and he sees things. And it must have been wonderful, like really wonderful, not supper wonderful, but like really wonderful. Because look at what happens here in verse 10. Remember, okay, before we look at verse 10, remember who John is. This John who is writing Revelation, he, he's not just some rookie. He's not some new person in the faith. He's not somebody who's just now learning about Jesus and the Lord. John is someone who has given his entire adult life to following the Lord. This same John is the one who loved Jesus. He was one of the disciples. He was there at the Last Supper. He was close as Jesus was being crucified. He was in the crowd that Jesus spoke to the large ones and the small ones, after Jesus was resurrected. This John, who is now imprisoned because he is one who has been preaching about Jesus Christ. This is what John was brought to in verse 10. After all this hallelujah, after all of this, and after the angel says to him, these are the words of God, John says, and how honest he must have been to write this down. He says, at this, I fell at his feet to worship him. You and I are trying to make sense of this revelation thing. We've been trying for a while. Some of you are so sick of it. I know. I know. I know. Give me two more weeks. <laughs> You're, let's move on. Let's study something else. Others of you are fascinated. Oh, I never thought of this. I never thought of that. This connects over here. This connects over there. And there's just all that mad scientist Bible stuff. Like, look how this all goes together. And you love it, right? We're at different places. I get it. I know. We're trying to work through this very difficult prophetic word of God. So we've been working here through Revelation. Have any of you ever just said, this is just too much? I, I don't get it. I, I, I'm just going to have to wait and see. Have any of you said that? I have. Not for every passage. There's some of them like, oh, I get that. But boy, there's some tough stuff in here. Imagine what it would have been like if you're John seeing this. Now, John would have known his Old Testament very well, inside and out. John would have known the prophecies about who Jesus was. John would have seen Jesus. I mean, this is not some guy who's, who's new to amazing stuff. I mean, John would have been in the boat seeing Jesus walking on the water. John, John would have seen Jesus heal people. John himself would have healed people with the power of Jesus. John has been around the block. And yet, when he sees all of this, when he hears this great multitude, the rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder, he wants to fall at the feet of an angel. Now, if you had asked John before this vision, John, should you ever worship angels? John would have said, no. No. In fact, John wrote some other things in the Bible that said, worship God only. But here, John is, is so overtaken. It's almost like he just kind of loses himself. It's so, boy, wonderful. It doesn't even sound strong enough, does it? But look what verse 10 says. John says, at this, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, this is the angel speaking to John, don't do that. And we get it, right? <laughs> don't do that, John. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. The angel says, I'm just telling you about Jesus, John. And, and John kind of comes back into his own. He's like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. But what must this have been like? If it's enough to kind of get John out of sorts that he you know, accidentally or, or mistakenly falls down to worship this angel, of course you and I are going to be confused from time to time. Don't stress out about that too much. Read the Word of God. Study it as best you can and realize that there are some things that are just going to be beyond your understanding. You're going to see this next week when we talk about stuff called the millennium. Ooh, that's going to be fun and terrible. Wonderful for a Sunday before Christmas. But apparently John got his bearings back because he saw more. And here in verse 11 of Revelation 19, John says... I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. You know, it's hard to figure out sometimes whether any of the wars on our earth are just. 
it, it's hard to figure out if you study history and you go back and look. And of course, now there's all the deconstructionism. People want to pick apart everything when, of course, the victors get to write all the history. And so we only get their perspective. I, uh, it is hard to figure out, though, even the stuff happening today in a world with cameras everywhere and reporters everywhere. Have you noticed how difficult it is to figure out if what's happening over there or over there or right out here? Have you noticed how difficult it is to figure out if what's happening is just, if it's right? It's kind of a mess out there, isn't it? A lot of wars fought just because somebody wanted something they didn't have. That's in the book of James. You can look that one up. And if you are a student of history, I wonder what you have discovered about the causes of most wars of our history. What has caused the wars of history? Isn't it usually something tied to property or money or power? What do I have? What can I get? What can I do? Property, money, and power. Jesus is different. With justice, he judges and wages war. And then John, who for a moment hasn't bowed down to the angel, John who's back on his feet apparently now and, and kind of seeing things clearly, now he sees more of this white horse and its rider coming out of heaven. He describes the rider. It says in Revelation 19, 12, his eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. Crown him with many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. Oh, I'm curious to figure that out someday. When I, when I get to sit in heaven face to face with Jesus, I don't know when. I guess after all the martyrs are finally killed. Part of me wants to say, hey, Jesus, what, what, what's that all about? What did John see? And, and, and if Jesus is the only one who knows the name, well, how did John know to write it down? Did John get to see it? Or was it just a different language that he couldn't read? Or did Jesus, did you just tell him about it and say, I'll show you later? These are little curiosities that fascinate me. There is so much that we get to learn someday. John goes on in his description of this Jesus. Jesus isn't named yet, but we're going to see that this is clearly him. Verse 13, he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. Whose blood? His? Somebody else's? He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Okay, this is very clear. We connect this back. John, in the beginning of his gospel, John, the guy who's writing Revelation, says in John 1.1, 1, 1, Kevin, I think you talked, I don't see Kevin, where's he at? He's here somewhere. Kevin talked about this in Sunday school a little bit today. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word of God. And here he is again. He was there in the beginning. I'm talking like in the beginning, all the way back. If you can imagine it back that far, Jesus was there with God and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity lasting an eternity past and eternity future. Jesus, the one who came to earth as a baby child. Jesus, the one who grew up. Jesus, the one who lived the perfect life, who died on the cross, rose from the grave, who ascended into heaven. He's coming back. Jesus, the one who is in heaven right now, is preparing for this day that John got to see a picture of. Jesus will be coming back on a white horse, eyes like a blazing fire, crowned with many crowns, a name written on him that no one knows. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. His name is the Word of God. Verse 14, he is not alone because the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses. They are dressed in fine linen, white and clean. No blood on those folks. Coming out of his mouth, this is the word of God, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. John got to see this one and we get to hear it. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Here is Jesus coming back, and out of his mouth, Jesus, remember, the word of God, out of his mouth comes a sword which is going to, what does it say? Strike down the nations with his mouth. Now remember, Revelation has a lot of symbolism here. There's a lot of stuff going on. I, I, I have a hard time picturing Jesus coming back on a horse with a sword sticking out of his mouth. 
But over and over we're told in Scripture, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, that we are supposed to take up our sword, which is the Word of God, which is the Scripture. Jesus bringing the power. Does the Word of God have power? I mean, here we're looking at Revelation at the end of time. What do you remember about the beginning of human history? How did God create the heavens and the earth? With his Word. God spoke, and it was so, if you're not sure about that. Today over lunchtime with your family, read Genesis 1 and 2. Just go back to the very beginning. God's word, God's voice has power. It doesn't say with his hands he created all this. With his word, God created the heavens and the earth. And then there's this whole litany of things in Genesis 1 that God created with his word. And God said it is good. Here at the end, Jesus says, no, this is bad. And now with his word, what does he do? This sword that comes out of his mouth, the same powerful word strikes down the nations. In the beginning, God creates with a word. At the end, God judges and destroys with what? Seems to be a word. How is that going to look? Exactly what is that like? I don't know. I don't know. But is it so difficult for us to imagine that Jesus would come back and just speak and it would be? Could that happen? Sure it can. What are all the armies coming for? I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, we'll talk some more next week and in two weeks about what, what could this be. But do you see what's happening here? Out of his mouth comes a sword with which to strike down the nations. And then he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. God is angry at all these people who have rejected him. And with Jesus Christ speaking somehow, these people are struck down. Why? Well, because when the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings speaks, things happen. Again, we, we come back to this place and we see, we see Satan and evil personified so many times here in Revelation. We, we fall into this false thinking that, well, you know, I hope that God can wipe out Satan. Of course he can. God's word makes things happen. Satan's word only makes things happen if you agree with him. Satan, the father of lies, twisting it all the time. Jesus Christ, who is the way and the truth and the life. We now see in Revelation 19, without a doubt, who wins. It's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What's it going to be like once these nations are struck down by the word of God? Well, it's going to be a mess, quite frankly. Look at verse 17. I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair. Now, if you are a squeamish person, I apologize. Not making this up, not trying to dramatize it for, for any kind of special effect. It just says it right here in the scripture. Verse 17. I saw an angel cried to all the birds flying in the air, quote, here's what the angel said. Come, gather together for the great supper of God. We heard about the the wedding feast of the Lamb just a few verses ago. This is different. Gather together for the great supper of God so that you eat, may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. All these ones who had rejected Jesus are being judged, and the birds of the air are going to feast on their flesh. And then verse 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. So picture this. Picture this. There is on the earth, the kings of the earth, all of these who have consistently rejected the Lord. Whatever nations and powers and armies they have amassed, it is with them. Again, all of these people who have rejected the Lord. And there, as it tells us in verse 19, there is a beast. This is Satan personified. There's this beast who is evil, who is inciting them, who is working them up into a lather. All of these armies gathered together, why? To wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But what did we see earlier? Here is this rider coming from heaven, dressed like this, looking like that, followed by those, and out of his mouth, comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. I wonder, church, I wonder if Jesus' army had anything to do at all. I wonder about that. 
I mean, would not the power of Jesus be enough to wipe out the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies? I mean, if God can create the universe at a word, can he not wipe out an army with a word? I, I don't know. We're told some things that are going to happen. We're not told everything about how it's going to happen. Interesting stuff, isn't it? To kind of try to think about a little bit. If you're at the spot where you're saying, enough of the symbolism. I've had enough of this figuring out what means what. Okay, I get it. We're almost done. Look at verse 20. This beast, he was captured. With it, the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. So evil, evil, evil. With his signs, he deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. And then the two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. These two are thrown alive into hell. The armies are all wiped out and are supper for the birds. Look at what it says in verse 21. The rest. So these two were captured. The rest were killed. Killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves in their flesh. It doesn't say they were killed by the armies, does it? That's interesting stuff. Oh, perplexing stuff. Wonderful stuff. You know, it strikes me as difficult to cheer for annihilation. You know, I, I don't ever want to cheer for anybody having a bad time here on the earth. I mean, sometimes I'm tempted to, right? Have you ever, oh, they finally got what's coming to them. That's, that's a dangerous place to be, and I try not to go there. But here, what does all of heaven do? What did we read in the first whole chunk of Revelation 19? Hallelujah. 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 God is doing his work. The word of God is going forth. Here, good just tramples evil. God brought all of the universe into being with his word, and now the word is going to take back all that was out of line. I want to end by thinking about this. We don't know when all this is going to happen, exactly what it's going to look like, how it's going to all go down. We know who's going to win. What do we do in the meantime? What do we do to, to fight evil here in our day? I'm drawn to a couple Bible verses and to a Christmas hymn. In John 15, John, the same guy who wrote Revelation, he records Jesus as saying to his followers, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In John 15, 6, Jesus warns his disciples, he says, if you don't remain in me, in other words, if you turn away, you go your own way, you reject me, he says, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. That sounds like a little bit of revelation, doesn't it? Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, it will be done for you. Because if Jesus' words are in us, we're not going to ask for just the things that we would like to have. We're going to ask with the words of Jesus. And so, of course, it will be done because when Jesus asks his Father, it happens. And in verse 8 of John 15, John records Jesus as saying, All of this is to my Father's glory that you would bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Today, earlier, we sang that lovely but difficult to sing song, O Holy Night. One of my favorite Christmas songs. Favorite to listen to. Difficult to sing right? It's one of those songs. It's all over the place. Any of you find yourself out of breath? Any of you find yourself like me just once in a while kind of shutting your mouth and opening your ears? You just want to listen to the congregation around me? I don't know if you noticed the words that you sang. These are very familiar. It's the first verse of the song. But here's what you sang half an hour ago. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, hear the angel voices. 
And then it keeps working and building and building and building. But I was struck by this line, and it came, I've been getting a lot of postcards lately from, from schools and colleges and seminaries. Do you get that from like places you've been before? Maybe you get them from businesses. Do you get calendars and all that? All these commercial things coming into the house. I, had, uh, I got to read from a seminary professor the other day uh, about this whole line of the soul felt its worth. It made me think about that a minute. I knew we were going to sing it today, so it really got my attention. O holy night says, long lay the world in sin and error pining. Can we say amen? Just pining. Jesus, will you come back? Till Christ appeared, and now the soul felt its worth. Any of you feel like you're just pining? Just pining for Jesus. Old-fashioned word, I know, but you, you get what's happening here? Just pining for Jesus. Pining for God to make things right. Pining for things to be better. The world in sin and error pining. God, this is such a mess. Things are so dark. What's going on? Until, the Christmas carol tells us, until Christ appeared and the soul felt its worth. See, when we're in that time of pining, sometimes we start to say, well, things are such a mess. Things are so dark. Nothing matters. And then some of us, some of us make that turn and say, and I don't matter either. Until Jesus Christ comes and then the soul begins to feel its worth. Wait, we're worth it for him to come back? We, we lot this whole mess, this whole earth, Jesus is giving himself for us? The soul begins to feel its worth. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. This talks about the excitement that comes with Jesus Christ. Now, many of the people, when he came in the manger, they were expecting the king on the horse. It messed up a lot of folks who were looking forward to the prophecy of this coming king who would, who would reign with an iron scepter. They expected it 2,000 years ago. Instead, they got a child. And many said, that can't be him. And then when he grew, they expected someone who would, do, who would do amazing things and finally wipe out these kings of the world. But instead, he allowed himself to be killed by them. And they said, this can't be the Messiah. But here our Christmas carol says, you know, when Christ appeared, there were many who, be, who began to feel their worth, a thrill of hope, a weary world rejoicing. That's what happened when the babe in the manger arrived. I wonder what kind of thrill and hope will be present when he comes back on that white horse. This is what we're looking forward to. In this in-between time, yes, Christ has come. He's done his work. He's shown us everything we know to be saved. And yet in this time, Satan right now is still at work trying to drag us down. And there are many of us who are turning our backs on the Lord. But instead, we should be looking forward to this return of the king. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. This Advent season, church, this is a good time to think about where your allegiance really is at. This is a good time to think about how you're living, how you're teaching your children, how you're teaching your grandchildren. This is a good time to be taking stock of your life and thinking, am I really submitted not only to the child who was born and placed in a manger, but to the coming king who is going to wipe out all evil with a word. Over and over and over in Revelation, we're shown that people have the opportunity to turn to God. What, don't wait until the plagues start to come. Right now, we have an opportunity to turn to God. And I don't know if there are any of you here today who haven't done that yet. I don't know if there are any of you who are sitting here who don't yet know the Lord. I don't know if there are any of you who are still stuck in your old life, held down by your sin, by your mistakes, by all the regrets. Jesus says, Hey, you nations, you people from every tribe and tongue and language, just turn away from all that. Turn to me. That's what it means to repent. Just leave it behind you. Jesus says, just come to me and say, forgive me, Lord, and you will be forgiven. This is the promise. This is how our souls begin to feel their worth when we realize that he loved us enough to come to earth for us, not just once, but twice. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices. Can you hear the warning amidst the joy? Can you hear God calling? We're going to, uh, we're going to sing a final song this morning.
It's a familiar song for us, not necessarily a Christmas song. I'm going to invite the band to come forward. Um, We've been thinking a lot this morning about the, the victory of Jesus, the thrill of hope, and the weary world rejoicing. This is one of those rejoicing songs. But if you're at a spot today where you're not sure about all this, where you're still figuring out this whole repentance thing, I want to make sure that you don't leave here today without talking to somebody about that. So after our service is over, I'll be at the back door, or I'm sorry, at the front, I'll be back at the front door, and and I'll be glad to talk with you about any questions that you might have. I'll be glad to talk with you about anything that might be on your mind. Don't leave this place today without making sure that your heart is aligned with Jesus Christ to the king who came and the king who's coming back. Right now, I'm going to invite you to take a big breath and stand up and get ready to sing this song that we've done many times, The Lion of Judah. I think it applies. celebrate Christmas. That's what we're celebrating. It's not just, hey, this historical thing happened, isn't that cool? It's not even just, we have hope for for life now and a life to the full. That's good, but that's not all. We celebrate the Lion of Judah, the one who is coming back, and the angels will cry, hail the Lamb, rule in power as the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. So church, I hope that you'll go out from this place understanding the worth of your soul. You're worth so much that Jesus Christ was willing to come and live here all those years, die on the cross, and he's willing to come back. Why? I mean, he could have just wiped us all out years ago and said, fooey on all of it. He didn't. He's waiting until everything is right so as many of us as possible can go and join him for eternity. That's the worth of your soul. Go out from this place knowing it. And knowing that he doesn't make mistakes, he doesn't drop things that need to be picked up, he doesn't lose people that don't want to be lost. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, this is our Christ. I pray that this is what your Christmas is about. Amen?
Amen. Now go in peace. Hey there.